Hi little skeletons, it's Disney Queen Skelly here and welcome back to another Fun Facts video. So today we're doing Fun Facts for Miracle on 34th Street, the uh, 1947 movie. Enjoy! In the untranslated dialogue with the Dutch girl, Chris asks her what she wants for Christmas. She says she wants nothing, telling him she got her gift by being adopted by her new mother. When Edmund Gwen accepted his Best Supporting act Actor Oscar, he said, Now I know there's a Santa Claus. According to Natalie Wood's biographer, during the shoot, she was convinced that Edmund Gwen was actually Santa Claus. By all accounts, he was a very good-natured man on the set. It wasn't until she saw him out of costume at the rap party that she realized he wasn't Santa. The film shot during a bitterly cold New York winter. On several occasions, the cameras literally froze. Maureen O'Hara remembered that a woman named Vaughn Mel lived across the street from where they were shooting exteriors and allowed the crew to warm up in her house. In gratitude, O'Hara took her husband and herself to the famed 21 restaurant, and she was so excited all she could drink was a glass of milk. Unbeknownst to most parade watchers, Edmund Gwen played Santa Claus in the actual Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade held on November 28, 1946. He fulfilled the duties of most parade Santas, including addressing the crowd by Philip Tong, who played Mr. Shellhammer, and later unveiled the mechanical Christmas display window to the accompaniment of Piotr Ilyich Tchaikovsky's Nutcracker Suite. This gesture symbolized the opening of the Christmas season there. The house shown at the end of the film is a 17 is a 1703 square foot single family home built in 1943 at 24 Derby Road, Port Washington, New York. It looks practically the same as it did then, except that the roof line has been altered by the addition of a window. Both Macy's and Gimbel's were approached by the producers for permission to have them depicted in the film. Both wanted to see the finished film before they gave approval. If either had refused, the film would have had to been extensively edited and reshot to eliminate the references. Fortunately, at the test viewing, both were pleased with the film and gave their permission. The cast and crew were unanimous in their opinion of Edmund Gwynn. They loved him. Alvin Greenman, who played Alfred, called him a dear man, and Robert Hiatt, who played Tommy Mara Jr., said in a 2001 interview, He was a really nice guy, always happy, always smiling. He had this little wink, twinkle in his eye added Maureen O'Hara. By the time we were halfway through the shoot, we all believed Edmund really was Santa Claus. I've never seen an actor more naturally suited for the role. Maureen O'Hara's time with Natalie Wood was something she always treasured. I have been the mother to almost 40 children in movies, but I have always had a special place in my heart for little Natalie, she said. She always called me Mama Maureen and I called her Natasha, the name her parents had given her. Edmund Gwen gained 30 pounds to play Chris. According to Hitta Hopper's Looking at Hollywood's Newspaper column of May 3, 1947, when the picture opens at the Roxy, Macy's will close for half the day so its 12,000 employees can see the first showing. In her autobiography, Maureen O'Hara nicely summed up what the film had come to mean to her over the years. Everyone felt the magic on set, and we, will, and we all knew we were creating something special. I am very proud to have been part of the film that, was been, that has been continually shown and loved all over the world for nearly 60 years. Miracle on 34th Street, 1947, has endured all this time because of the special relationship of the cast and crew. The uplifting story and its message of hope and love which steals hearts all over the world every year. I don't think I will ever tire of children asking me, are you the lady who knows Santa Claus? I always answer, yes I am. What would you like me to tell him? The scenes of Macy's were shot on location at the main store on 34th Street itself. Shooting was complicated by the fact that the crew's power needs exceeded the store's electricity capacity and required additional power sources arranged in the basement. Alvin Greenman, who played Alfred, was the last surviving cast member at the time of his death on July 14, 2016, at the age of 86. Valentine Davis got the idea for the script while struggling through the Christmas shopping crowds, trying to find a present for his wife. The commercialism he saw made him wonder what the real Santa Claus would make of it all. Edmund Gwen improvised his reaction to the beard pulled so that Natalie Wood would be surprised. The song that the little Dutch girl sings is Sinterklaas Kapuin Che Leg Wat in Yen Shoen Che Leg Wat in Yen Larsige Danke Je Sinterklaas Je One translation is Saint Nicholas Little Rascal Put Something in My Little Shoe Put something in my little boot. Thank you, little St. Nicholas. The film received a B rating, morally objectionable in port, 
from the highly influential Legion of Decency because Maureen O'Hara played a divorcee. On Chris's employee card, he's listed the names of Santa's reindeer as his next of kin. While dancer is used frequently, the correct spelling, according to a handwritten manuscript by Clarence Moore, is actually Donder, and that's how it appears on Chris's employment card. The scenes at the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade are of the actual parade held in 1946. As such careful representation was necessary for the shots as retakes were obviously out of the question. 20th Century Fox had cameras positioned along the parade route at the starting line at 77th Street on Central Park West on the third floor of an apartment building at 253 West 58th Street in Herald Square and on 34th Street at 7th Avenue. It was a mad scramble to get all the shots we needed, and we got to do each scene only once, said Maureen O'Hara in her 2004 autobiography, Tis Hersel. It was bitterly cold that day, and Edmund and I envied Natalie and John Payne, who were watching the parade from a window. The Dutch girl spoke, the, spoke true Dutch, but with a heavy American accent. Despite the fact that the film is set during Christmas, studio head Daryl F. Zanuck insisted that it be released in May because he argued that more people went to the movies during the summer. So the studio began scrambling to promote it while keeping the fact that it was a Christmas movie a secret. In the 70s, Natalie Wood and Robert Wagner were approached about doing a TV remake of the film with Natalie Wood's daughter, Natasha Gregson Wayne, as Susan. Wood turned it down because she she had been a child actor herself and didn't want Natasha to start acting at such a young age. Maureen O'Hara was ultimately forced into her role against her will as she had just returned to Ireland before being called back to America for the film. However, she immediately changed her sentiments upon reading the script. The film grossed over four times its budget. Robert Hiat came up with his with his because my daddy told me so line that wasn't in the original script when dr pierce explains chris's belief that he is santa claus he offers for comparative purposes a hollywood restaurant owner who believes himself to be a russian prince despite evidence to the contrary but he rather conveniently fails to recall his name this was a reference to michael romanoff owner of romanoff's in hollywood a popular hangout for movie stars at the time in 2006, the film was ranked number 9 on the American Film Institute's 100 Most Inspiring Movies of All Time. Unusually, there were two Christmas films nominated for Best Film at the 1947 Academy Awards. This one and Henry Coster's The Bishop's Wife, 1947. They joined It's a Wonderful Life, 1946, the year before as only three Christmas ones to be nominated for that. The entire cast enjoyed a special bond, according to Maureen O'Hara, and always got along beautifully throughout the production. Each evening when we were not working, we called O'Hara, Edmund, Gwen, John, and I went for a walk up Fifth Avenue. Natalie had to go to bed, but we didn't. We stopped and window shopped all the time all the, at all the stores, which were beautifully decorated for the holiday. Edmund especially loved those nights and acted more like the kid who might be getting the presents instead of the Santa who would be giving them. I got such a kick out of seeing the expressions of window dressers when they saw Edmund peering at them. I knew then that he was going to make a big splash as Santa Claus. The real R. H. Roland Hussey Macy died in nineteen died in 1877, 70 years prior to the time of the film. The Macy's Christmas window di window displays were sold to FAO Schwartz, which in turn sold them to Marshall and Ilse, Bank of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. They were displayed at the lobby every December in its main branch on North Water Street. According to the number of toothpicks on the table next to the telephone, Miss Shellhammer has apparently drank nine martinis by the time she calls Walker. Percy Helton, who played the drunk Santa, was also in White Christmas 1954, where he played the train conductor. Lux Radio Theater broadcasted a 60-minute radio adaptation of the movie on December 22, 1947, with Maureen O'Hara, Edmund Gwen, John Payne, and Natalie Wood reprising their film roles. John Payne hoped to do a sequel to his dying day and even took matters into his own hands. John really believed and loved Miracle on 34th Street 1947, said Maureen O'Hara, and always wanted to do a sequel. We talked about it for years and he eventually even wrote a screenplay sequel. He was going to send it to me but tragically died before he could go get around to doing it. I never saw it and have often wondered what happened to it. John Payne, who had starred in many films at 20th Century Fox, 
had been unhappy about the quality of roles he was being given. And when he read the story, it was rumored and later disputed by his daughter that he bought the film rights as a starring vehicle for himself. Unusual for a major studio film, characters identified with a competing studio, Warner Brothers, Bugs Bunny, Beaky Buzzard, etc., are prominently featured on the walls of Macy's Santa Claus display. The rivalry between Macy's and Gimbel's depicted in the film was very real. They were just blocks from each other in New York and major competitors for some bit for the same business. The rhetorical question, does Macy's tell Gimbel's, was a popular phrase used throughout the 1930s and 60s, which meant that business competitors were not supposed to share trade secrets with one another. In 1999, Macy's chose the film as the theme of its famed Christmas windows display. The windows were adorned with miniature recreations of the film's most famous scenes with the old-fashioned mechanical-style window displays that were phased out in the 1960s. Macy's creative design executive Sam Joseph said, I thought, wouldn't it be kind of a cool say goodbye to this century the way they said goodbye to the last century? What better vehicle to use than Miracle on 34th Street, 1947? Marina O'Hara was recruited as Macy's special guest who unveiled the windows to the public and signed autographs. I know John Payne, Natalie Wood, and Chris Kringle are up in heaven looking down on us and smiling, she said. 20th Century Fox studio head Daryl F. Zanuck was very much against making this film because he thought it was too corny to succeed. He finally agreed to a medium-sized budget provided writer-director George Seaton would accept the next three assignments unconditionally. Seaton, who desperately wanted to get the film made, agreed. The three sub subsequent films he went on to direct for 20th Century Fox after it were Apartment for Peggy, 1948, Chicken Every Sunday, 1949, and The Big Lift, 1950. Natalie Wood was eight years old when she made this film. Natalie Wood was making two other films concurrently with this one, Scooter Ho, Scooter Hey, 1948, and The Ghost and Mrs. Muir, 1947. The film was one of the first ones to be colorized in 1985, resulting in some controversy and an uproar from film purists. The film's original title was Christmas Miracle on 34th Street, but because the release date was moved to the summer, the first word was dropped from the title. Other working titles included The Big Heart, My Heart Tells Me, and It's Only Human. This was Thelma Reader's first film debut. The character of Thomas Mara is clearly based on Thomas E. Rewey, a Manhattan district attorney who went on to become the governor of New York and twice the unsuccessful Republican candidate for president, 1944 and 48. Jerome K. Wan, who played him, and Dewey bear a strong physical resemblance and both were, wore mustaches, highly unusual for professional men of the time. Also, Judge Harper mentions that the district attorney is a Republican, which is also a rarity back then and elect for elected officials in New York City. Maureen O'Hare was welcomed back to Macy's in 2004, where she made an official appearance to sign copies of her autobiography, Tis Herself. Edmund Gwen was offered the role of Chris after his cousin, Cecil Kellaway, turned it down. Jean Lockhart, who played Judge Harper, co-starred in another Christmas classic playing Bob Cratchit in Edwin L. Mart. Marin's A Christmas Carol, 1938. After Thomas Mara's son, Thomas Jr., finishes testifying, he tells Chris, don't forget a real official football helmet. Tim Mara was the owner of the New York Giants at the time. This was Alvin Greenman's first movie. He said that Edmund Gwen always took time to mentor him. This was Alvin Greenman's film debut in the uncredited role of Alfred. He later played another Alfred in 1994 remake, Miracle on 34th Street, 1994, which was his final film. He is the only actor to appear in both films. He is also credited as Santa in his final film. Edmund Gwen's beard was real, according to Maureen O'Hara on the DVD commentary. This film is included among the American Film Institute's 1998 list of a 400 movies nominated for the top 100 greatest American movies. The film ranked number 5 on the American Film Institute's list of 10 greatest films in the genre fantasy in June 2008. The role of Chris was originally offered to Cecil Kellaway, who turned it down. The role went to Edmund Gwen, Kellaway's cousin. Calloway did Santa in Bewitched, A Vision of Sugar Plums, 1964, which featured child star Bill Mummy. The post office department was a cabinet-level department of the electric branch of the U.S. federal government from 1829 until 1971. The film was shot on location in New York City, which was new for the studio, 20th Century Fox. This was only their second movie shot there. The first was The House on 92nd Street, 1945. The wonderful bargain of $8.50 for a toy fire engine would be worth $99.32 in today's money. Lux Radio Theater broadcast a 60-minute radio adaptation of the movie on December 20, 1948 with John Payne, Maureen O'Hara, and Edmund Gwen again reprising their film roles. 
It broadcast another 60-minute adaptation, also with Gwen, in, on December 1954. Granville Sawyer Porter Hill Hall has a nervous habit of picking at his eyebrow. When he asks his secretary to phone for him, she exhibits the same nervous habit. Chris Kringle makes reference to the B-29, a World War II bomber aircraft. While enlisted in the U.S. Army Air Forces during that war, co-star Payne had recently starred in a training film as a B-29 co-pilot. Susan's letter to Chris contains a three-cent stamp, first-class postage, and a 13-cent stamp special delivery. Screen Directors Playhouse broadcast a 30-minute radio adaptation of the movie on December 23, 1949, while Admin Gwen reprising his film role. It broadcasts a 60-minute version also with him on December 21st, 1950. Cinematographer Charles G. Clark was taken off the picture and sent to Mexico to finish principal photography on the troubled production of Captain from Castile, 1947. Lloyd Ahern Sr. replaced him. The film was the only one to feature an Oscar-winning Santa Claus portrayal as played by Edmund Gwynn. When Maureen O'Hara first got the script, it was called The Big Heart. The film won three of the fair... Fair Awards and it was nominated at the Academy Awards, but last Best Picture to a gen the lost Best Picture to a Gentleman's Ag Agreement, 1947. In a separately filmed promotional trailer, Charles Tannen plays studio head Ed Schaefer, a thinly disgui disguised impersonation of Daryl F. Sh Zenick and George E. Stone, Gene Nelson, and Harry Seymour, play other studio executives at a mock screening of what was to be the original trailer for the film. In a separately filmed promotional trailer, Rex Harrison, Ann Baxter, Peggy Ann Garner, and Dick Haim, who were appearing in another 20th Century Fox productions at the time, but not in this one, discuss, it, discuss its merits. The film was the only Best Picture Oscar nominee of the year to be also nominated for Best Story. When Chris is talking to Granville Sawyer, he first implies that Granville presents himself as a psychiatrist then switches to him as a psychologist. When Chris Prince, he is as old as my tongue and as little and a little older than my teeth, he meant he didn't have teeth as a baby. The film takes place on no from November 28th to December 25th, 1946. The film was the only one of 1947 to be Oscar nominated for Best Picture, but not Best Director. An oversized coffee table book on the film, Miracle on 34th Street, a Hollywood classic by Sarah Barker Danielson, was published in 1994 by Smith Mark. When Judge Harper is talking to his political friend, he says that CIO and the AFL, instead of the traditional way, the AFL and the CIO, since this is before the merger of the two unions in 1955. When Chris is talking to Granville Sawyer, he first asks if he is a psychiatrist, then he uses the word psychologist. Spoilers ahead. The house that Susan sees at the end of the movie that she, Doris, and Fred enter is according to the the Nassau County Tax Records, located at 24 Derby Road in Port Washington, New York. 21 mailbags are carried into the, into the courtroom at the end of the, Chris's hearing. When Charlie talks to the Judge Harper, he says the CIO of the AFL, instead of post-fusion 1955 name AFL-CIO. Daniel D. Tompkins was vice president under James Monroe. And that is it for fun facts for The Miracle on 34th Street, 1947. I thank y'all so much for watching, and I'll see you tomorrow. Bye, little skeletons. Stay safe, and I love you guys.